no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. If you've been paying attention, you know that SpaceX is planning a test flight of its Starship rocket system as early as tomorrow, Monday the 17th of April. It is not unlikely that this flight will be delayed. But when it does fly, the first Starship will not try to land either the booster or the starship itself. The booster will be brought down in the Gulf of Mexico. And if the booster survives to separation, this flight will be a complete success. The starship, if it survives separation, will be on its own ballistic trajectory, circling most of the Earth and coming down near the state of Hawaii. Starship has its heat shield tiles installed, and will try to survive the heat of re-entry. The Starship will not, however, try its flip and burn maneuver. It will instead impact the ocean at terminal velocity broadside. The Starship is made from high quality steel, but this impact will surely tear it to pieces, which is probably the intended effect. No one wants a 50 meter long steel cylinder floating around in the Pacific Ocean. But if the booster survives to separation, and the starship survives to re-entry, a paradigm shift will occur. The people of planet Earth will have finally exceeded the mass-to-orbit capability of the Saturn V rocket. And SpaceX is already planning a starship upgrade. The newer starships will have nine engines, three sea level and six vacuum, instead of the three vacuum engines they have now. This will allow a payload increase of almost 50% taking us from the current mass of 150 metric tons to around 220 metric tons. And this ship will be 10 meters longer, allowing for larger payloads and propellant tanks. I have heard some people say that besides delivering Starlink satellites to orbit, there is no market for super heavy payloads right now. And to a degree that's true. Until a capability exists, the market does not develop. But once we are looking at getting more than 200 metric tons to orbit, what are the possibilities? The answer is simple. The first few Starship missions to the moon are being planned now. More mass to orbit means fewer refueling flights to establish a colony on the moon. But beyond the moon, chemical propulsion does not make sense. The first few founders of Starbase Mars will probably fly on methane-fueled Raptor engines. But to truly colonize another planet, you will need nuclear thermal and nuclear electric rocket engines. Nuclear thermal engines run propellant, liquid hydrogen almost always, through a superheated core. The liquid hydrogen flashes to a superheated gas, which absorbs the heat and carries it away, exhausting it out the back. A nuclear thermal rocket engine can have a specific impulse of around twice the best chemical rocket engine, which is the hydrogen burning RL-10 and almost three times better than the methane-burning Raptor. Nuclear thermal rocket engines are not new technology. We built and tested these before. These images are from the NERVA project, which stands for Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications. But even these are not the best we could do. There is a type of nuclear reactor called a trigger reactor. This stands for Training Radioactive Isotopes General Atomics. These are reactors built to pulse at a very high power output. These pulses produce high energy neutrons to create isotopes and for training and other experiments here on Earth. But they can also be used to flash heat liquid hydrogen to temperatures much higher than what can be achieved by nervous style engines. And before the heat can be absorbed by the engine, the hot hydrogen is exhausted through the nozzle. Think of this type of engine described in this lesson like a microwave oven heating what's placed in it, but not getting that hot itself. These engines can produce a specific impulse as high as any ion drive, while still producing enormous thrust. These can shorten the flight to Mars from about eight months to just a few weeks, dramatically reducing the supplies consumed en route. 
and saving more for the colonization effort itself. The drawback to nuclear engines is that they are so heavy, but the NRX A2 seen here only had a mass of about 3,175 kilograms. Now this is a lot compared to most rocket engines, more than twice as much as the Raptor. But Starship could easily lift nine of these on a nuclear propulsion module and still have more than 150 metric tons of capacity left over. So let's picture three Starship launches, a propulsion module with some hydrogen fuel, another fuel module, and a habitation and command module with landing ships, all with a mass of around 200 metric tons each, giving us a 600 metric ton nuclear powered spaceship in low Earth orbit. This is how you colonize Mars, using starships to get from the surface to orbit, then deep space cruisers for interplanetary flights. Ships like this will make it possible for us to quickly explore and build outposts on the moon, Mars, and even Mercury. But beyond that, it will open up the rest of the solar system. To help us understand the solar system, the European Space Agency started the Cosmic Vision Program. This is a long-term project, which includes sending scout spacecraft into deep space, helping answer some of the most important questions in space science. Here you see an Ariane 5, launching from the Kourou Space Complex in South America. This rocket is carrying the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. The spacecraft does not have the Delta V to make it to Jupiter on its own. It will first be thrown into a lunar return trajectory like the Artemis 1 mission. It will fly out past the moon and fall back to the Earth. Unlike the Orion capsule and Artemis 1, however, Juice will miss the Earth, getting a gravitational boost that will throw it out toward Venus. These are called gravity assists and will go like this. Earth launch out to the moon, moon gravity assist back to Earth, another Earth assist to Venus, Venus assist back to Earth, Earth assist out to Mars, and a Mars gravity assist out to the orbit of Jupiter. In total, it will take seven and a half years for this scout spacecraft to reach Jupiter. Once there, it will give us valuable information, performing multiple flybys of the moons Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. The first two, Europa and Ganymede, are known to have oceans from data sent back by several spacecraft. It is believed that the third, Callisto, may also have an ocean under its surface. These oceans are kept from freezing by the tidal forces generated by Jupiter. While orbiting these moons, the JUICE spacecraft will need to survive a lot of radiation because Jupiter's massive magnetic field traps ions, just like the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. Any life on Europa and Ganymede should be shielded from the radiation by the kilometers of ice, but the spacecraft will not be, and neither would any outpost humans tried to place on these worlds. But Callisto is special. Callisto is outside of most of Jupiter's deadly radiation belt and would make a perfect outpost for humanity to study the oceans of the Jovian moons. There may be bacteria-like organisms surviving underground on Mars, but with a combination of warm ocean water and lots of minerals and energy, there is almost certainly life in the ocean worlds under the ice of Jupiter's moons. Perhaps someday even, we will build a human city on Callisto to study these new worlds. All of this will be possible once we have affordable super heavy lift access to space. Something to think about. By the way, if you want to get a child interested in astrobiology, this book, written for my daughter long ago, is about a young cephalopod growing up in an ice-bound ocean world. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.